the Society for Culture and Environment extends a warm welcome. You are watching a session on cuisine and intangible culture. The Lucknow Cookbook. Sunita Kohli in conversation with Neeta Khanna and reading of Neemat Nama by Dr. Meera Das from the Bhopal Literature and Art Festival, January 2019. Ms. Sunita Kohli is an Indian interior designer, architectural restorer and furniture manufacturer. She was awarded the Padma Shri by the Government of India in 1992. She developed a passion for cooking from her mother and enjoys trying new recipes. The Lucknow Cookbook presents the city's culinary expression of its Ganga Jamuni Tehzeeb. Ms. Neeta Khanna is an Indo-Canadian with an academic background in English literature, journalism, aesthetics and critical theory. A cultural entrepreneur and business owner, she has been a writer and producer in advertising and film production. Dr. Meera Das is the Secretary of the Society for Culture and Environment and co-director Heartland Stories Bhopal Literature and Art Festival. She's a former member of NMA and convener in TAC. She's an art historian, conservation architect, architect with specialization in matters of cultural policies. It is my singular friend, privilege and pleasure to lead the conversation and moderate the discussion on the Lucknow Cookbook and cuisine as intangible culture. With me is also Dr. Ira Ishwardas, who's going to introduce us to the illustrated Distinguished panelists for the evening, Sarita Kohli, who needs no introduction, and uh, Dr. Meera Ishwardas. Dr. Meera Ishwardas is an art historian and okay. conservation architect, and she's also the co director of the Popal Literary Festival. She's a writer, a former member of the National Monuments Authority, and convener of Intact. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the Lucknow Cookbook. I've done moderated this, I've been on two panels with Sunita to launch it in Hyderabad, which shares Lakhni, the Hazib of Lucknow. Uh, you know, it's the same uh, Ganga Jamani, the Hazib in Lakhan and uh, Deccan and Lucknow. And I've uh, been on the panel in Bombay with uh, Javed Akhtasa, Sunita Kohli, and uh, Pavitra Rajaram uh, from Good Earth moderating it. So the Lucknow Cookbook this year will cross its first launch anniversary at the end of January. Within this year, it has been launched at almost all the premier literary festivals and has received tremendous accolades and critical acclaim across uh, print and electronic media. So it has been praised variously as compelling reading, much more than a cookbook, and so on. But what? Uh, but why does a cookbook with everyday recipes has found resonance with the average reader amongst readers? To answer that, I would like to quote S. Prasanna Rajan, editor of Open Magazine, from his review of the book. Speaking of the Lucknow cookbook, he says, open quote, This is a cookbook as a cultural testament by one of India's most accomplished receipts. Every recipe in this book tells a story that is more than just good culinary. It takes us to the private kitchen of our heritage, lest we forget the range and richness of the taste of the subcontinent. Marinated in ancestral memories, the Lucknow cookbook draws its ingredients from the cultural history of a different time. Never before has tradition been presented more tastefully." Close quote. Prasanna is talking here, of course, of the book and its delectable recipes, but much more than that. He's alluding to an intangible cultural heritage, which forms the basis of our communities and societies. But what is intangible cultural heritage? An intangible cultural heritage is, in fact, a formal UNESCO term and defined in its charter of convention as the practices, representations, expressions, as well as the knowledge and skills, including instruments, objects, artifacts, cultural spaces, that communities, groups, and sometimes even an individual recognize as their personal heritage, cultural heritage. 
So where do we see this manifested? It's manifested in domains like oral history, language, uh, uh, social uh, festivities, rituals, knowledge and practices concerning nature and the universe, performing arts, of course, traditional craftsmanship, and most recently, food heritage has been added by the UNESCO to this long list. These are all intangible things that communities hold and cherish and are they passed from generation to generation and they are also at risk of loss. And for instance, food heritage, they've already added two, uh, uh, two diets and of course the first one was the Japanese because they have such a long tradition of uh, a tea ceremony, the way they cook, the way they live, and recently the Mediterranean diet has been added to them. From India, there are 13, uh, uh, 13 uh, intangible cultural heritage list, including Chao. So, in our discussion today, we are going to explore our intangible cultures through the story of the Lucknow cookbook and the medieval, the Nimatnama manuscript of the Sultans of Bantu. Sunita, I would like to open the conversation with you. But before we link the cuisine of Lucknow to its intangible culture, I have to ask you, you are a celebrated interior designer. You are an you know, architectural restorer of uh, great repute. And for close to half a century, your profession has been of interior design and architectural restoration. You have done many celebrated public buildings and hotels in India and abroad. So I have to ask you, how come a cookbook at this time? I think this happened quite serendipitously. My mother is a legendary cook and her first cookbook, Continental Cuisine, for the Indian palate, which simply means a lazy khana of Lucknow, came out, it has been in three prints, it became a success overnight. So she had done another set of, uh, of recipes, 345, which were to be published by another very well-known publishing house, who I'm sure regrets why that project fell through, but it had something to do with the commissioning editor leaving or... Uh, and then, you know, it went into cold storage. So I had had a meeting with... Uh, I mean, I was in conversation and commissioned to do with Alif, my publishers, uh, a book on heritage and design. So whilst I was speaking with David Devadar, I, I wanted my... my mother's 94. Uh, so I wanted my mother's cookbook to come out very quickly, much before anything that I was doing. So I asked him, I said, David, do you know of a good cookbook publisher? He immediately said, you know, we don't do cookbooks. But let me give it a thought. Next day, fortunately, he called me to say, Sunita, I will take, we will do this cookbook. But the one condition is that you will co-author the recipes and that you will uh, write a 10,000 word introduction to your parents' story. In any case, that's, that's history now. I thought, how easy can this be? Because before I became a designer, I thought I was very inlaid, BA, Masters, incomplete PhD on Christopher Marlowe. I said, itni mushkil cheez to honi sakti. Famous last words. So that's how the book came to be. I had to work on it. For 12 weeks or 10, 10 weeks, 12 hours a day, including Sundays, to finish this. So anybody who thinks that writers have an easy job, and I'm not one. I wrote this book, Chalte Chalte Ho Gai, but you know, let us see. So that's how the book came to be. Thank you, Sunita. I have to say that the resonance found amongst readers is due actually to the a note about a book which actually precedes that 10,000 word introduction called Vatan Lost and Vatan Found from Lahore to Lucknow, my parents' story. So first I'm going to ask you, I'm going to request you to um, read some of the passages from a note about it. With pleasure. 
Actually, I thought I was done with it when, uh, when I had written the introduction. And, but right before it went into print, uh, David Dar said, you know, you have to write a note about the book. So this is it, which Nita has asked me to read. So I'm going to read passages from it. And I began by writing that Lucknow has always been a city of refinement and its cuisine reflects these sensibilities. In many ways, Lucknow was considered the cultural capital of North India. It was here that the Urdu language was developed to near perfection. Art and architecture, particularly Indo-Saracenic architecture, flourished in this city built along the banks of the river Gombe. Architectural heritage is history written in stone, as they say. And this is true of the many fine buildings that still exist in Lucknow today. But most importantly, Lucknow was and still is a city known for its composite culture, its Ganga, Jamni, Tehzeeb. Now, but what is the quintessence of this culture? It is an amalgamation of the finest of Hindu and Muslim thoughts and their mutual acceptance. Unlike this terrible word tolerance that is being used today. So I write about this acceptance because that is the life one has lived in Lucknow. This composite culture, plurality and complexity was also reflected in the easy acceptance of the varied cuisines of the various communities that resided in Lucknow. And then I go on to say, I, you know, I say my father arrived in 1947, shortly after, after the partition of India to make a home in this city. 70 years later, we still call Lucknow our home. And uh, Lucknow was a very easy uh, and accepting society. My parents were warmly welcomed by several old residents when they arrived here. The city's rich and varied cuisine is partly due to this easy acceptance of people and their cultures from other parts of India and also of those who came from across its border, borders as did indeed my parents. I go on to write that the culture of Lucknow which my parents encountered in the late 1940s was undoubtedly Muslim. But Lucknow was also the home to communities of Hindus, Brahmins, Kshatriyas and Kais, along with British residents who had stayed on post-1947. And of course, Anglo-Indians, Christians, Parsis and Bengalis. They had for generations resided in Lucknow. Sindhis and Punjabis were rather late entrants. Each community had its own food preference and many different methods of cooking. The samosa in its present form was invented in Lucknow. Today it has become ubiquitous and you find it all over the world. Chaat also originated in this city. Lucknow also has its own distinctive biryanis and palaos, which are both vegetarian and non-vegetarian. It introduced the dampuk style of cooking. Lucknow's cuisine was influenced by the cuisines that travelled down the Silk Route from Turkey, Persia, Afghanistan and then down to Quetta and Lahore and eventually finding their way to Lucknow. Many of the recipes in this cookbook are distilled from this rich culinary heritage. And then I write at the end that David Lowenthal, the American historian renowned for his work on heritage and spatial concepts of the past and the future had famously pronounced that the past is a foreign country. This cookbook, although palpable with nostalgia, selectively recaptures events and objects from the past that are a part of the intangible heritage of food and familial memories of gentler times. These are collective memories that conserve a sense of continuity, of belonging and of being rooted. I believe that food engenders social and family harmony. It anchors us and connects us to the past, grounds us in the present and gives us a sense of identity and belonging. Our personal histories define us 
and I have chosen to define this partly through Lucknow's food traditions. The preparation of food is learned by observation, it is a process of osmosis. In our family, all four generations are reasonably good cooks. This book documents the recipes that we have learned from my mother and from our many friends in Lucknow. And one can certainly cook from this book, but one can also read through the recipes to get a glimpse of Lucknowi culture and of the lives behind these recipes. This is a book for cooks and for armchair cooks. Because for people who really love food, it is a lens through which to view this particular world. Thank you, Sunita. That was pretty magnificent. Uh, and thank you for sharing the reason that you, as it were, for this beautiful book. Now, Lucknow has famously inspired storytellers like Kipling and King. It has inspired literature, poetry, some of the finest music, uh, art, dance, and uh, film. Raja and uh, Junoon come to mind right away. It has been a muse to many. But Sunita, your journey, your relationship to Lucknow, Lucknow was not home to you in the sense of the rootedness of home. You came to Lucknow uh, through your parents' journey. A journey of migrations and displacement. So we'd like to know what is your Lucknow story? Uh, to share with you very briefly my Lucknow story, I have to go back to my parentage. My mother comes from Balochistan, uh, Quetta. My father's family is originally from Jaisalmer, but for a few generations they had settled and were living in uh, they were Lahori, so they con in Lahore, so they considered themselves Lahoris. I was born in Lahore uh, right at the time of the partition of, of India and so I was born in undivided India and then my father chose to settle in Lahore quite by chance. Years ago he always told us that as a college student he had been to Lahore and he found it full of grace and charm. And that was the city that most closely approximated Lahore in terms of its culture. So after partition, I mean, it's a long story. Hopefully you will, uh, you know, have the book and read the introduction. Uh, but uh, uh, he came, they came to Delhi. And they came to Delhi and, and uh, he somehow didn't like Delhi and he arrived in Lucknow. Thinking back of his college, that one college trip that he had made, that is how by chance, this is what happens in life. That, you know, they were refugees, they could have gone anywhere. But he chose Lucknow and I'm so glad that he did do that. Uh, when he, they arrived in Lucknow, then they settled and, and made life for themselves there. And uh, the first impressions of this city I was fortunate, I found a letter of his written in October 1947 together with its original Andalan. And that letter is like a page out of Samuel Pepys' diary because it says of what he encountered, kaise vaha ki log the, kaise vaha ki imartin the, and the graciousness and the, and, and when he doesn't speak very well of even back then, in comparison to Lucknow. So, and he speaks about, you know, he, they were staying in a hotel called the Royal Hotel, but, uh, which they <coughs> wanted to stay for three years. What was the price of milk and what was the price of fish? And so it's really, it's really documenting Lucknow in of 1947. And most importantly, he speaks about how welcoming the people were. Thank you, Sanita. And uh, I recall you also talking about the Great Famine of 1784. And also I wanted to ask you, what was your first feeling? You know, what does Lucknow evoke? As soon, you know, you say Lucknow. What's your, uh, without intellectualizing, I mean, that. You 
You know, uh, because I schooled in Lucknow, I went to a Roman Catholic convent, the Reto convent, and I have uh, I, I am very actively still in touch with my childhood friends from Loreto, including Rita, uh, Lal, and um, uh, we are Hindus. Uh, we came to a city predominantly Muslim in its culture. I mean, there were equal amount of Hindus, but the elite of the city was Muslim. Uh, so this, but. Most importantly, I mean, all my friends, whether Rita, Bina, Nilofar, uh, uh, you know, Nishad, Nusrat, these were all names. It's only when one became 11 or 12 that one realized that actually we belong to different religions. So we grew up in a very, very secular and uh, Lucknow of easy acceptance. Even today, even today, in spite of everything, when most biryani shops are shut during Navratri and there is always an exchange of gifts at each other's major festivals. So this tradition continues and, and I think this was set by the Nawabs of, uh, of, uh, of Lucknow, of Awad. Uh, Neeta referred to Nawab Asaf Udala, who was the fourth Nawab of Awad. And there was a terrible famine in Lucknow in 1784. Uh, so he had, so for famine relief, he started making this absolutely beautiful Bada Imam Bada, which exists today. Uh, and it actually defines that in the Rumi Darwaza, uh, defines the old city. And that's why Lucknow is called the Constantinople of, of the East. Uh, whereas Lahore used to be called the Palace of the East. So Asafu Dola for famine relief, so they started this building. But he also wanted to feed the people that his, his praja that was building this uh, monument. So huge bags used to be filled with chawal and you know, dal and meat and sabzi or sabkuch dal and wood cake. And what emerged is the booth. So that of course became more refined in his own kitchens. So there this slow way of cooking is what really defines Lucknowi cuisine. But more importantly I want to tell you that Nawab Asif Udala who I mentioned also in the introduction because of the Dambu way of cooking. Uh, you know, recently the Bada uh, Imam Bada has been taken off the, sadly, taken off the list of UP tourism. But we ourselves do not recognize our own histories. And that is, this is the same Nawab who donated the land. Uh, for the Gorakhpur Mat today. So they were very secular, so so did and up to the last Nawab, uh, Vajid Ali Shah, because as you know, he would dress as Krishna and do Ras Hila with his Begums. So Lucknow was and still continues to be a very uh, secular city where Ganga Jamni Tehzeeb is still alive. Thank you, Dr. Sunita, that was wonderful. And I, in this context, I remember the brilliant Jared Al-Pasam at the Bombay launch of the Lucknow Food Book. And he described Lucknow culture uh, so beautifully, an open quote, the perfect synthesis of whatever beautiful was imported and whatever wonderful was indigenous. He said it's a perfect synthesis, you can't have it better. Close quote. The flowering of language, music, dance, and cuisine in Lucknow was largely due in part to this syncretic assimilation of cultures, to this whole journey of communities, migrations, all that. So one of the ways to understand the roots of this cultural flowering is via the silk route, which finds so which Sunita finds a very special and personalized mention in your book. So could you 
walk us and talk us through that journey of the silk route and about the importance of the silk route to the cuisine of Lucknow. Well, you know, the silk route firstly is that not only just trade and commodities pass down it, but also art, ideas, food, and that's how it came to be. And it really struck me uh, on in one trip to Istanbul. In fact, it was the first of several trips to Turkey. You know, in Lucknow, we have uh, Garam Dahinka Shorba, which is a very hot favorite during the winter months. Now, we just take it for granted that many homes, because I have to tell you, this cookbook is not about Abadi cuisine. It is about everyday food. So the food is from several communities. Of course, you know, there are also recipes that have to be Abadi and things, but which all of us are cooking at home on a regular basis. So this Garam Tahinka Shorba, the first time in 1998 when I went to when I went to Turkey, I found that Bahadur Sabi Dahi ka shorba ye garam dahi ka shorba And so I started investigating. This is a Turkish soup which travelled down the Silk Route and came into our part of the world. Uh, and somebody recently told me that they have a version of it also in South India. That must of course have gone down the, the north-south mark, you know, which you speak so eloquently about, which you have described. So, um, and then traveling on, I think it was that same trip to Turkey or, or maybe a subsequent trip, uh, I was in Izmir because we had gone to see the Green Mosque. And lo and behold, I find a roundabout with, um, with an archaeological uh, road sign which says so many miles to Constantinople and so many miles to Multan, where my mother's maternal side of my mother's family comes from. I mean, we were in the middle of the Silk Route and some years later, I took a young grandson, who was then maybe 10 or 11, to see Shia and the Terracotta Army. And there, there's a sign which says, Xi'an, the end of the Silk Route. So you can imagine what all the Silk Route has seen, of which cuisine and the passing down of recipes is such an integral part. Thank you, Sarita. Um, your Shorba has reminded me of the main protagonist of the book, which is, though you said it's not Avadhi necessarily, but it's Lucknow's cuisine, you know. So, Lucknow's tehzeeb, tamiz, nafasat is uh, central to its culture, manners, etiquette, sophistication. And they've gone hand in hand with, uh, with cuisine being seen as an art form, the tradition of cuisine being seen as an art form. And under the patronage of various royal households, creativity was not just encouraged, but it was demanded. And in fact, there used to be intense competition between the royal kitchens of the Nawabs to better each other in original dishes. Uh, the presentation of the food was equally important. The refinement was so much more than the Mughals. It reaches a, reaches a zenith actually over there. And uh, the power, the masalji was different. The bawarji, the rakatdar, they were always at work. Imagining, evolving, much like our master chefs and the very celebrated chefs of today. The zenith of culinary refinement was Lucknow, was an hour. And we owe so many things that are on our table to this creative impulse and energy of the, of the Avati Nawabs. So I was lucky, in fact, to accompany you to one such palace. And that was last month for a Netflix um, food series shoot. And it was at, at the home, it was an Avati cuisine, uh, uh, one, one episode on that. And uh, Sunita, uh, I accompanied Sunita to the home of Jimmy Jahangirabad. And uh, we, uh, we had the great fortune of sharing the great Avati delicacies prepared in his kitchen for some of them on wood fires for two to three days. And, uh, 
Shabdeh, those gilawat ke kebab, nothing, I mean I've never eaten anything like we've eaten them over the past. Chakundar gosht, biryani, kurma salam, shirma made at home, and all these find a mention in your book. As well, the unique desserts like nimish, which is called, considered one of the most delicate desserts in the world. That's a, and there is a street counterpart of that in Delhi, and that's how you know the difference in the refinement, which is called Dalati Chat, which, uh, but there was we ate nimish that day, and it was, you know, something else. And uh, uh, many people don't, you know, we think of it as a lot of non-vegetarian food, but the milk is an you know, integral part of a lot of dishes, the vegetarian dishes, um, the biryani, you know, and the desserts, right? As well, tomato can you use because what was it called? <coughs> Tomato, you know, tomatoes came very late into, into, I think into India itself yeah. and somehow they were never accepted in Lucknow. So an older generation say to my mother still referred to tomatoes as Vilaiti Bhagan. So you don't really have tomatoes used, you know unlike the Punjab or anything where you know, or here yeah. And dairy farming is age old in Lucknow, which is there in Salma Hussain's book, she describes the whole process of that. And as well, the variety of vegetarian cuisine is also enormous, much more than you find even in the Deccan. And Dhubia, Dhubia Taroi, Dhubia Loki, you know, so everything was using, you have, I, you know, you can have Kala Chana with Kurchan Paneer. So, uh, dairy farming was very, very big, continued to be big. And that's thanks to the abundant produce from the river fed plates. I mean, it's rich in that. Uh, it would be interesting for our audience today to see some slides of, on this food, for which the recipes are given in your book, and they are multicultural to the, from all communities. So, Sunita, may I have a I have to tell you, please warn you, I hope the times go very smoothly, but I have a bit technologically challenged. So even to use this remote requires dexterity on my part. And here I am technologically challenged to the extent that this whole book has been written in long and with pencil. <laughs> Because you know, as you know, the, the Nawabs of Abadwashia 
and not so neat, like the Mughals were. So, so these are uh, some kebabs um, from Lucknow, I mean like Kakori and Machi ke kebab and Shami kebab. And uh, on the left are some vegetarian dishes like Tilke Alo and you know, to a lot of stuffed uh, Karela. Karela is a great favorite. Karela, Karoi, Loki, these are the preferred vegetables of a Lucknowi palate. And that of course is the Chaparatha and Palak uh, That's Irish stew, which is something that came from on the left, which came because of the British presence which was very strong in Lucknow and, uh, and Kerry came on this side in Nagasi Kofla and I have to tell you that the best cutlets that used to be made used to be made in the dining room of uh, in the dining rooms of the railway colonies uh, of the railway station in Lucknow is Charbagh and those cutlets I don't think one can ever taste this, have the same taste anywhere else Then this is of course uh, the this shirma and bakar khani, ulte tawe ka paratha and bon musalla. These are all recipes that are given in the book and the matter, fish and the with garlic sauce. Uh, and in fact, interestingly, my mother was delighted that when she, she always told us a story that when she first came to Lucknow, she found something called Balochi Machli. And being a Baloch, I mean that immediately gave, did, uh, uh, there was a sort of an emotive connect to it. As also, uh, there's something I relate in the introduction is that once we had invited uh, to a very small dinner, uh, the new High Commissioner of Pakistan, Ashraf Qazi. And uh, Ashraf, uh, I introduced my mother to Ashraf. My mother happened to be visiting from Lucknow. And wo, wo ke hai. my mother is also from Quetta. And then my, he asked her, so where did you live? And my mother said, you know, my father's house was on Little Road. So he said, oh, my grandfather's house was on Little Road. And they literally fell into each other's arms. You know, these are emotive connects which I think that is the last of that generation that will have them. So, then this is Kareli ki Sabzi, which uh, I think the best made this, this Kareli ki Sabzi recipe is from a friend of mine, uh, Farzana. And I think we make the best Karelas in, and then, uh, in, in North India. And then, we always have a narka reta and sabziyon ki tehri. And biryani of course, uh, which is... Uh, I have to tell you that biryani is normally... In, in, eat biryani on its own. And chawal is eaten at the end. Everybody who's from this part will know. And just with reta and things. And, uh, and then... There is a section on mita, rabri, and amalai, and this dish over here, jalebi pudding, is really my mother's invention. And this actually, how did this this dish come about? You know, my parents, or my mother in particular, um, they all had this. Uh, you know, they were all refugees, and that never really left them that they really didn't know, they didn't have enough because they had to really survive. Now the ladies used to come to our house, particularly in my parents' second home in Muslim. Sorry, I put my back to you all. I apologize. So there used to be jalebis would come and things or Hamesha Bache Hoi Jalebiya Hote Te. Ab Agle Din Uska Kya Kiya Jai. So my mother would soak it in milk and then, you know, beat up eggs and all that and eventually uh, it used to be baked and it's still a hot favourite. It takes very little time to make and of course, you know, my mother would carry this thing of, of recycling. Everything had to be recycled. Like once 
My parents have a beautiful home up in Masuri. Because Masuri has a huge connect for them, my mother's school there, etc. And I and in fact they were staying at the Savoy in Masuri when the partition took place. So I, my mother was, uh, we were having tea and coffee together and you know, tea cozies are used. I don't use them in, in Delhi, but it's a thing that up in the hills is used. So I asked my mother, I said, Mama, where did you get this tea cozy? She kind of squirmed a little uncomfortably. I said, I said, where did you get this tea cozy? She said, no, no, I don't remember from where it came. I said, you know what? It suspiciously looks like a kurta I had when I was 15 years old. I mean, that is how recycled things used to be. So these are, you know, uh, in Lucknow, uh, high teas became a very big thing. Coffee and high teas. And this was, I think, high teas were a British influence. And uh, as I said, you know, all four generations cook. That cake, although learned from my mother, it's a chocolate mayonnaise cake, has been cooked by her great granddaughter, my granddaughter. So, I'd like to point out that there's a lot of fusion cooking going on. You know, in a high tea, uh. you have samosas and you have the korma sandwich. Yeah. So, happy. There is, you know, this is how uh, my mother has always, uh, you know, as she went along, she would, as she went along, she would uh, do recipes and things, and uh, and there is yes, of course, that is part of cooking. Then you then you add something of your own and you give it another twist. So, and the last few slides are just something that is so integral to Lucknow, which is the eating of pan, and so that's an old uh, panda that belongs to me, and also the use of it. So our next slide, can I please? And that's an old 18th century itradan, makes it late Mughal. So I've shown all the slides. Uh, uh, regarding kebabs, uh, the wonderful syncretic cuisine, uh, the uh, abdi kebabs, kapuri kebab, uh, shami kebab, a lot of people don't know, comes from Syria because the uh, word for Syria, the name of Syria is Shams. And uh, kapuri was, of course, from the little principality of kapuri, which the Nawab had poor teeth, and you know, it was made with koya and not really soft. And from there I come, I'm going to lead uh, this conversation to Dr. Meera Ishwardas, Meera Ji, uh, to the Nimat Nama because, uh, you know, it's, uh, I'd like you, I'd like to take the story of Dante about 500 years back to the region of Malwa through Meera Ji's uh, presentation of the exquisitely illustrated 15th century manuscript the Nimat, Rana, na, the Nimat Nama manuscript of the Sultans of Mardu, one of the first, one of the first books to be written in Urdu, and possibly one of the oldest extant cookbooks in India, 1494. No precise date. But uh, uh, talking about Lucknow cuisine, uh, there is a, there are two things uh, which are mentioned in this and which are worth noting is one is that uh, shorba that you were talking about. Now this actually it, it mentions shorba and the shorba kind of comes from uh, it must have come from Turkey because Gayasuti who was the Nawab of Malwa he at some point abdicated in favor of his son. And then he moved to Manu. After he moved to Manu, he just spent his time writing this recipe book. Now this coming of the recipe book itself is so fascinating that this recipe book which was written in Manu, it was actually, it traveled to the Mughals because there is in the manuscript, there are some notations which mention that uh, the Mughals got it. But somehow landed with Tipu Sultan. The exact journey of how it kind of went from Mandu to, uh, to Mughals to uh, 
that in Bhutan there may have been many more copies, we don't know. These are illustrated copies, huh? beautifully kind of uh, uh, painted and all that. So it reached the uh, it, it reached the uh, Tipu Sultan, and uh, when the Britishers attacked it, they got this recipe, and it was rediscovered by the British in the 20th century at some point, 1950s, 60s, and they suddenly found that here is a fascinating uh, illustrated manuscript, and they kind of they found a professor. They had a professor who could read the, all that, and they uh, transcribed it. And uh, at some point, uh, they wanted to even get a, a Madhur Jafri to come and cook it, the, those recipes. But Madhur Jafri, I'm told that she kept the manuscript, but she never cooked any food. <laughs> <laughs> but irrespective of that, the shorba by itself is such a fascinating thing. And in this uh, manuscript, they talk about not just milk products, but they say that how, what the cow should be fed to get this shorba going. So it's not that any milk was, was kind of, uh, they, they would cook uh, shorba or they would cook, uh, even ghee is mentioned. So they are not talking about just any kind of milk, they are talking about the milk who has been fed with so, so and so, so and so, so and so, and only that works. So, um, you know, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it was a fascinating discovery and the illustrations uh, make you actually look at the architecture. And, yes, Swift illustration and beautiful architecture. And you can actually, if you have experienced Manu, if you have been to Manu, you can actually smell the air if you this. <laughs> you can see this is what you're looking, this is what you're looking for. Thank you. So, uh, I just wanted to introduce the book to all of you that there's something called in the 15th century. Amazing because there were no potatoes, there were no tomatoes, there were no milk, which was introduced much later. So, uh, over here, uh, uh, silk fruit you are talking about. Silk fruit not only brings it uh, its own uh, uh, non tangible, but it also influences the non tangible. So, having cookbooks is actually very, very fascinating because it, it kind of slices it at a particular time. And then you know what were the tools that you, you know, like uh, uh, what were the utensils they had, what were the mode of cooking, how are they? It's a, it's a much more. What is the kind of architecture where they are sitting and doing all that? So uh, with that introduction to the book, because it's very difficult to cook this food, have the ingredients you wouldn't know, have the uh, measures you don't know, uh, you can at some point measure how we have traveled and where we have traveled. With that, I thank Sunita Ji for... No, I want to interject and <laughs> say something about this Nimat Nama. I think that uh, Dr. Meera Das has really done human service of, I mean, we are all reasonably well read, of bringing to our attention this absolutely amazing book. Frankly, I had never heard of it till uh, Meera Ji mentioned to me when she asked me to come for, uh, you know, to attend this lit fest. So I think she's really done human service and very quickly we managed to get on Amazon uh, two copies of this uh, book for ourselves. And uh, because, you know, it is these histories that need to be documented. And of course, what Miraji said whatever the journey from Tipu Sultan, how it landed up at the India office library, then how Bob Skeleton bought it, I mean a great art historian brought it to the attention of another art historian and then how it got translated and we have it in its present form. Difficult book to get, you know, it's not available in the market but you can still think. So thank you actually Miraji for bringing such a book which is a treasure trove uh, to the attention of everybody and I hope through the dissemination of this Bhopal uh, Literary Festival that many many people will get to know that Ek Kitab Hai Nimat Nama which speaks about a cuisine of 500 years ago and everybody who has been to Mandu will, will recognize 
कि ये अपनी बिल्डिंग्स इतने सुंदर बना सकते थे तो यू नो वॉट फिटनेस सो इनकी कटनरी आज इन्होंने क्या क्या कॉन्ट्रीब्यूट किया सो थैंक यू मीरा जी Thank you for watching the session from BLF 2019. Kindly subscribe to our channel for more such videos.